Father, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. The Bible is the word of truth. The Lord Jesus told us, and he prayed, that it would sanctify us in the truth because your word is truth. It would set us apart. And we also know as your people that we need the anointing teaching of the Holy Spirit and also, Lord, just the covering in this time as we discuss a very important subject of Scripture and that, Lord, that we just come before you with hearts open wide to receive whatever it is that you have for us. And so, Lord, we pray that we would receive a word from you and that, Lord, that whatever is said from this pulpit would be honoring to you. And so we thank you, Father, for all these things with the hearts of expectancy. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when we studied Revelation chapter 19, we witnessed the Lord's triumphant coming. His bride, the covenant people of God, the elect who are drawn from every tongue, tribe, and nation will all attend what the Bible calls the marriage feast of the Lamb. But when the Lamb comes, the Lamb is going to come as the Lion of God as well because he's going to defeat his enemies at the Battle of Armageddon. And back in chapters 16 through 19, we saw how there was someone who was behind the Antichrist or the false Messiah, the false uh, prophet as well. And who in the spiritual realm is behind these individuals is, of course, none other, none other than Satan himself. And the day is coming, and the Bible tells us that when the, the nations of the world are going to gather in the valley of Jezreel, which is about in the, approximately the middle area of the land of Israel, and at that time, the city of Jerusalem is going to look like it's been hit by a wrecking ball because of all the things that God's going to do in his judgments, which we looked at in the seven trumpets and in the seven bowls. But in the midst of all these things, King Jesus is going to come again. And he's going to come in all of his might and full of glory, full of grace, full of truth. Our, our Lord, as the Bible describes him, is going to come clothed in, in righteousness. And he's going to be uh, riding on a, on a white horse, a white stallion. And he's going to descend from heaven with his angels and with his redeemed. And the Bible says that when he comes in less than one hour, because the Lord doesn't need much time to defeat his enemies. And if you want to write some references down about that one hour, Revelation 17, 12, chapter 18, verses 10, 17, and 19, the Bible says that by the sword of his mouth, by the breath of his lips, by the word of his power, the king of heaven is going to come. And in that day, He's going to defeat his enemies. And what happens when he comes, though, is he's going to deal very specifically with these two individuals. I don't know who they are, but they'll arise someday, this Antichrist and false prophet. And I want you just for a moment to look at the end of chapter 19, just to remember that there are no chapter divisions, really, the way the Bible's given. And we need to read these things carefully. In chapter 19, picking up in verse 19, speaking of the false Messiah who is always called the beast in the book of Revelation, John writes, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him, that's referring to Christ, who sat upon the horse and against his army, and the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. And these two were thrown alive into where? What's your Bible say? Into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. Now this is, going to be very, this is a very important detail, and I'll explain why in just a few moments. And then verse 21 says, And the rest who were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat upon a horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. The Lord Jesus, the Bible's telling us that when he comes back, he's going to very specifically deal with these two individuals. And they're going to be cast where? Into the lake of fire. And in the Bible, that's the place the Lord Jesus also spoke of. And in the Greek language, it's the word Gehenna. It's really, it's a reference to hell itself, that place of eternal doom. And it's at this point, it's a prayer that we pray in our service. We pray, Lord, 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth, as it is in heaven. And when King Jesus comes, he's going to establish his reign and rule. He will not only then be the king of heaven, but he's going to be the king of the earth. Now, just remember, there's no real chapter divisions. And so what we have just read about the Antichrist and the false prophet, the story continues in chapter 20, and that's where I want to pick up reading today. So follow along with me in chapter 20. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the abyss, and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things he must be released for a short time. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus, and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark upon their forehead and upon their hand, and they came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead didn't come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which are written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Wow, that's a very serious verse, isn't it? There are three important subjects in chapter 20. And just as I sat before the Lord decided that I would have to, it's going to take me three weekends to get through this chapter because there's some really important things that I want to teach you all about. One of the things I realize in our church is we have some people in our church that are new in the Lord, and, and when they're hearing this stuff, this, for them, they're hearing it for the first time. And so I have to be really careful in the way that I teach because I think it's important that people learn these things. You know, you've got to realize God is giving us a glimpse into the future. You know, and, and because it's coming from God, we can, we can trust him. These, these are things, I, I couldn't make this stuff up. These are only things that are known in the mind of the Lord. One of the subjects that comes up in this chapter is about Satan and about Satan's final demise. And that's where I'm going to find my focus today. Uh, next Sunday, I want to talk about what's this all about Christ's universal reign? Why does this phrase, a thousand years, keep coming up? Because it comes up a number of times in chapter 20. What's that about? How am I to understand Christ's reign? And then there's this last event, which obviously is a really serious event. It's referred to the great white throne judgment, which we just read about. And I want to take a week, and I want to talk about that too. But today, we're going to start and just spend our time talking about Satan. That's, you know, that's kind of a tough subject to talk about. When I woke up this morning, uh, just 
just as I was waking up, I just said, Lord, I'm dealing with something today. You know, it's really serious. Would you just hedge about our church, hedge, hedge us all about today as we take on this very, very important subject. Before we actually get to the scriptures itself in chapter 20, think with me in the, in the Bible, where does Satan make his first appearance? Do you remember? In Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden. It's at that time that Satan first tempts Eve. And then Eve, who, who falls for his trickery, then convinces her husband Adam. And then, of course, when Adam eats of the fruit of the tree, what happens next? Well, they, 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 the human race itself is literally plunged into sin. And with sin comes also what? Death. Death. And so Satan is, is the one that initiates this whole thing that takes place. And then Satan becomes really the adversary of God from Genesis to Revelation. We see his adversarial role in the, in the classic example of this is the book of Job. The book of Job opens and says, now there was a man named Job and he was a righteous man. And that's the righteous man who the accuser of the brethren. Have you ever heard that phrase made in reference to Satan? He goes before God and says, God, I'll tell you why Job worships and loves you and lives a righteous life. It's because, God, you've put a hedge around him. And, of course, you know how that whole story goes, that, that God allows Satan to do just certain things. And always Satan is always limited by God. Uh, later on in the Old Testament, in 1 Chronicles 21, I was reading in my devotions, and, and Satan appears in that chapter. And in, in 1 Chronicles 21, it's the story about how King David was supposed to trust in God for everything, including whenever his enemies would come up against him. But then Satan tempts David in that chapter. To, he puts it into his mind to send some people out to go and number the number of people, how many you know, people he has in, the, in his army. Now, why was that bad? Because by counting the number of people in his army, it was in effect saying to God, well, I need to know how strong I am, humanly speaking, rather than trusting God for that. By the way, I, I tell the fellows at the back, please don't ever tell me how many people are in the service. That's not what's important. It's that you're here. And uh, I, I don't know if that's a correct application of that chapter, but I, I've always resisted this idea that somehow there's power and strength in numbers when really the power and strength that we should find is in the Lord. And, you know, throughout the scriptures, Satan, for example, is, is presented as the roaring lion. Have you heard that, Isaiah? That he goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whomever he can devour. That's found in 1 Peter 5.8. And by the way... I am giving a lot of references today, and on the back of your bulletin, I've listed for you all the scripture references, so you can look there if you want to look ahead. But Satan would devour anyone that he could devour. The Bible tells us this. Do you remember the story with Jesus and Simon Peter? It's found in Luke chapter 22, verse 31. The Lord, of course, the Lord Jesus, who can see into the spirit realm, says to Simon, 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 behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he might sift you, what? Like wheat. Do you remember that account? I regret to say this, but I think that's one of the things that Satan wants to do with God's people. And I think that's what his demonic horde would love to do with God's people. I know you can see with, with terrible stories with pastors who have fallen that, that Satan would sift many like wheat. But not only Pastor Dan, yourselves as well, and, and your families, your, your children as well. The Bible describes Satan as the father of lies. He's the murderer from the beginning. Think about this. Satan and, and his demonic hordes are often behind the suffering of people. Do you remember when the Lord Jesus came and, and he cast out demons and sometimes those demons had caused people uh, to be deaf or, or, or to be blind? Do you remember the story about the father who begs Jesus, please, please heal my son because his son would be thrown into convulsions and then his son would fall into the fire and he would burn himself. Satan's behind all sorts of, of, of terrible evil and yet he's very crafty. 
Because in 1 Corinthians 11, 14, it says that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Do you know if Satan were to put on a costume at Halloween, it wouldn't look like the costumes that people buy in stores because the Bible describes him as a wolf in sheep's clothing and Satan would devour families. I'm reminded of that little verse in Jude 4 that, that just like a snake, he would creep in through through uh, uh, creep into even God's house among God's people. He would try to work his way into God's church if he could. What does Satan want to rob us all of? The joy of our salvation. What does Satan want us all to do? He always wants us to fall into the temptations, to fall for those temptations. Uh, Satan tries to convince people that God's way isn't the best way. I mean, I've seen it. I've seen it where even with Christian people who become deluded for whatever reason and somehow convince themselves that their way is better than God's. You think about what's that really saying? That's putting yourself above God, isn't it? And isn't that what Satan wanted to do himself? He wanted to have a seat higher than God. And in the New Testament, in Ephesians 2.2, 2, he's called the prince of the power of the air. In James 4.7, we're all told to resist the devil. And if we resist the devil, what will he do? He will flee. He will flee from you. He'll run away. The Bible also says that we're to take up the full armor of God. Uh, that's one of our senior members, Ed Chatterton. He tells me that's one of his favorite sections of Scripture. And, I, and, and Ed says that when he wakes up in the morning, before he puts his clothes on, he puts on the full armor of God because he really believes that, that Satan is active. And why? Because it says in Ephesians 4.11, 4, we're to arm ourselves because that you may be able to stand strong against the schemes of the devil. You know, one of the things that surprises me, and I say it's theologically, but also just practically, that, that there are some people who, who believe that, that Satan's not active today. I, I would question that thinking because why would God give his church instructions in the books of Ephesians and, and, and the book of James and in other places like 1st or 2nd Corinthians? Why would God warn the church about Satan unless he were active today? You know, just interview a few missionaries. Talk to Brad and Ellie Harris. Ask them how Satan is at work in the land of Kenya. I'm sure by the time Valerie and Casey come back from Vanuatu, they're going to have stories to share as well. I, I think of Carol Joseph with Jews for Jesus. That lady's out there on the front line. She does evangelism on the street corners of New York. This last year, she was in Paris. She was in London. She was in Jerusalem. Now, can you imagine being a believer, a Jewish believer, on the streets of Jerusalem, you know, and standing for the Lord? Satan is very active throughout the scriptures. And one of the things that we learned in Revelation chapter 12 is that a day is coming when, when the Bible says that God is going to cast the accuser of the brethren out of heaven. In other words, as if God's going to say to him, Satan, I've heard it enough now. You're out of here. But the Bible says that he's going to come down to the earth in great wrath. And it's at that time he's going to possess that false Messiah and he's going to unleash his fury upon believers. People, people don't like to hear that they might be persecuted, but the fact of the matter is if you stand strong for Jesus, you're always going to be persecuted. There's a little verse in Timothy that says, those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. My oldest sister, whose husband's in the ministry, said one time, she said, if, you're, if there's nothing going wrong with your life right now, you're probably doing something wrong. You know, there might be some advice there. Well, when we come to chapter 20 in Revelation, we discover, though, that while Satan has been active throughout the centuries, there is a time coming when God is going to say, enough is enough. And it's going to be God's plan. It's not going to be Satan's plan. And Satan, despite all his angelic power, and folks, this is important to hear, Despite of how we may view him, he is a trite pawn compared to heaven and earth's sovereign king. Satan is putty in God's hands. 
And in the passage that we read today, we learn that first, for a season of time, a reference to a thousand years, which I want to take up next weekend, Satan is going to be bound where? What, what does the Bible say? Where is he going to be bound? Look again in verses 1 to 3. Where is he going to be sent? To the abyss. Now, do you remember when I said to you earlier that when Jesus comes back and he defeats his enemies, I, uh, we read the passage where it says that the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet are thrown where? This is where it becomes important. They're thrown where? Into the lake of fire, into hell. But what the Bible is telling us is that when Jesus comes back, when the Antichrist and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire, Satan, on the other hand, is going to be sent somewhere different, to a place called the abyss. The scriptures describe here that God, uh, that this is what John saw. He saw an angel with a great chain, and that this angel comes with this great chain and then binds Satan, and Satan is sent to the place called the abyss. The abyss is different from the lake of fire. The abyss was mentioned before, by the way, in the book of Revelation. I'll just give you the reference. In chapter 9, verse 11, the abyss is called a bombless pit. I don't know where it is, but God says it exists. I also know in Scripture, in that little book of Jude again, that there were a certain number of angels, the Bible says, that they left their first domain. Do you remember that Scripture reference? And that they have been kept in eternal chains in a place called the bombless pit or the abyss. In other words, God has some sort of spirit prison somewhere. It's not hell, but it's a place where God can bind those angels who have rebelled against him. And what the scriptures are telling us here is that at the beginning of this season of time when Jesus Christ comes back, see, there's a lot more stuff that's going to take place. A lot of people don't realize this. There's a lot more that's going to happen. And that's what chapters 20 through 22 are actually going to tell us. And so Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years. And again, I'm going to talk more about that thousand years next Sunday. But then secondly, if you look further down in the passage, it tells us in verses 7 through 9 that once that season of time is completed, and only because of how God has planned and purposed things, because God is sovereign in all things, Satan is going to be released again after that season of time. Do you notice there in verses 7 through 9 it says, after those thousand years were what? Completed. He's going to be released for a very short season of time. He's going to be allowed to go back out into the world again to deceive the nations once again to hopefully muster up those that would follow him in a final war against God. And there's a reference to this place, Gog and Magog. Some people think that refers to to the land north of Israel. Some have referred it to the area where Russia is today. Um, and, and these are just ideas that people have. But here's the point. When Jesus comes back, the first, when he comes back, he's going to wage war against the Antichrist and the false prophet and those armies who follow him. But in this final battle, the one that I'm referring to now, this time it's going to be literally Satan himself that's going to seek to lead this final rebellion against God. But when he comes to lead this rebellion, God is going to dispense of him just like this. And he's going, and the Bible tells us in verse 10, then where is Satan going to be cast? This time into the lake of fire. Do you see why I wanted you to see the difference between the abyss and the lake of fire, because they're ob it's obviously referring to two entirely different places. And what's the plan that God has for Satan at the very end? He will be tormented, tormented day and night forever and ever. You know, I really ache for people who have never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the truth is, 
Hell's a terrible place. And the way it's described here, that Satan himself is going to be there day and night, forever and ever, and you could add, and ever and ever. Think about who's going to be in hell. Satan, all the demons who have followed him, the Antichrist, the false prophet. And then the Bible also says, anyone whose name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life. You know, it is a very serious subject, but think about, isn't this why God sent his son into the world? You know, there's an amazing passage that says, while we were yet enemies of God, yet God still has reached out to us in his great love and mercy. Though the Lamb of God on his way to the cross was despised and, and, and they insulted him and spit upon him and they whipped him, he still went to the cross for those for whom he would suffer and die. Amazing stuff. You know, there's a legendary story. I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it was, uh, but it's a story. I don't know if it's about C.H. Spurgeon or D.L. Moody or someone like that. But the story is told that this old saint was asleep in bed. And he heard a noise. And he rolled over and he opened his eyes and he saw the devil sitting at the end of his bed. But the saint's response wasn't what you'd expect. Because upon seeing the devil, he said to him, oh, it's just you. And he rolled over and went back to sleep. Revelation chapter 20 tells us that God himself is going to drive the final nail in Satan's coffin. The Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 16, Upon this rock I will build my house, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I'm just wondering this weekend, are you certain about your eternal destiny? When I read about that Lamb's book of life, are you absolutely certain that your name, that your name is found, is, is in that book? Listen to me, I think that what people need is the truth. I know you can go to some churches where they'll never talk about hell. They'll never talk about judgment. They just talk about happy things. I can think of nothing happier then the person who hears about hell and says, I don't want to go there. I know I need Jesus. I need to trust in him because salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by God's grace alone. With your heads bowed today and your eyes closed before the Lord, I just have to ask you, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? You know, a prayer doesn't save you. Raising a hand doesn't save you. Walking an aisle doesn't save you. Giving offerings doesn't save you. The only one who does the saving is God. But he invites you to believe. The scripture say, says, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Dear friend, would you believe in Christ today? from your own heart? Would you confess before God and repent of your sin today before God and say, Father God, I, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. Father, I'm deserving to go to hell. I deserve to be there in that lake of fire, but Father, today, I plead for your mercy. Please save me. Lord Jesus, please save me. Father, there may be very well people in this room today that upon hearing this message today realize, you know, I'm not so sure my name's in that book, and I sure want it to be. Lord, your word says that you desire that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. Father, would there be someone here today that you're calling to yourself? Is there a young man or a young woman in this room, Lord, today, that your spirit 
would birth again, that they would come to you and by faith believe in you. Father, is there someone today that would cry out from their own heart, God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, I pray that someone would come and all by your mercy and grace. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen.